My name is Mark Clampin. I'm the Director of Astrophysical Sciences Division here at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Till recently, I served as the Observatory Project Scientist for the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. And now part of my job is overseeing the scientists that work on the telescope. Whereas the Hubble Space Telescope was primarily an ultraviolet to visible um, imaging uh, telescope, James Webb will work in the infrared. So it basically um, is designed to operate from just down at the edge of the visible band pass all the way out to 30 microns. So it covers a wide range of um, infrared imaging capabilities and spectroscopic capabilities. Now, if you're working in the infrared, infrared is uh, heat radiation. So you need to make sure that you aren't seeing your own thermal signature. So one of the big um, issues that we have to deal with in designing a telescope like this is to make it extremely cold. So it's colder than most of the sources that it's trying to image. And so this telescope is designed to operate at about 40 degrees Kelvin, which is 40 degrees above absolute zero. Now, how do we get it that cold? Traditionally, infrared telescopes have been flown with a dua of liquid helium, and the helium keeps the telescope cold, but it also slowly boils off. So after a couple of years, you no longer have a functional um, infrared observatory. With this telescope, we've decided to go with a different approach that's called passive cooling. And the way passive cooling works is that you fly the telescope with this big sunshade, which is um, a five-layer uh, membrane arrangement. Each membrane is about the size of a tennis court. And we fly the telescope so that the sun is always on this side, and the telescope, its instruments, and all of the optics are in the shade on this side. And these five membrane layers uh, allow us to basically get the telescope down to the required temperature of around 40 degrees Kelvin. And that doesn't fit together with these membranes in any telescope fairing um, for a rocket launcher. So what we have to do is fold everything up so that the telescope will fit in the fairing and then we have to unfold it again and deploy everything after launch. So as a result, rather than using one solid mirror, we have to actually make the primary mirror here out of 18 segments, and that allows us to actually fold some of the segments around the side of the payload. And the secondary mirror here actually folds up vertically. And these uh, membranes get rolled up and stowed around the telescope on pallets during the launch phase. So this is really what what you can think of as an origami telescope. It's like a very complex origami problem, except that once it gets to orbit, we then un unfold the origami puzzle rather than creating it. So this is um, a beryllium mirror. It's called the SBMD, a subscale beryllium mirror demonstrator. And it's um, part of the philo philosophy that we've used on JWST, which is to do technical demonstrations of complex technologies before we actually start building uh, real uh, mirrors for the telescope. So the big challenges with beryllium are to polish it to the required prescription, which is very hard because beryllium is a very stiff metal and you actually um, put stress into the surface of the mirror as you polish it, which means you need to remove that stress during the polishing process. So it's much more complicated than just polishing glass. The other big challenge is to make sure that the material actually performs um, as advertised so we built this technology demonstrator to make sure that the mirror was stable at the right temperatures, that we could actually polish it to the required prescription, and then just to verify our basic concept for how this mirror would work. Uh, when we polish the JWST mirror segments, we actually remove about 92% of the material to lightweight them. So the mirrors are actually really just a very thin array of ribs with a very thin faceplate on the surface. This telescope has a number of unique capabilities. Uh, first of all, it's got a six and a half meter aperture. And what that means is that you can collect a lot more light than you can, for instance, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see much fainter objects. It also is designed to work in the near infrared. And so we can actually work in a new band pass that we haven't been able to uh, do this kind of in-depth imaging uh, with in the past. Hubble can image out to about 1.7 microns. With this telescope, we can go all the way to 5 microns in what astronomers call the near infrared, and then all the way out to 30 microns in the mid infrared. This opens up um, a lot of new molecules um, that we can see when we do spectroscopy. 
for instance, if we're studying the atmospheres of planets around other stars. If we're trying to do cosmology, uh, the large aperture combined with the infrared uh, capabilities means that we can see the, hopefully the very first galaxies that formed in the universe. So what you see here is the culmination of about, um, for me, 12 years of working on James Webb Space Telescope. This is the, uh, what we call the OTE, the optical telescope element. And it's basically the whole of the telescope structure that sits above the uh, sun shields that we talked about. And that means that you're looking here at the 18-segment primary mirror, the deployed secondary mirror, and you can actually see the gold on that small mirror. And just to give you some perspective, that small secondary mirror is not very different in size to the Spitzer primary mirror. So that's how, how big a jump in capability this telescope is going to be. Now, the primary mirror segments are all black, as you can see in the video, and the reason is that we keep everything that's facing the ceiling, what we call cup up, covered so that they're not collecting dust particles. This is an extremely clean, clean room, one of the cleanest in the country, but we're very concerned about every single piece of dust that gets on the mirrors because that will degrade science performance on orbit. Um, it basically produces scattered light. So what you're seeing is the primary mirror segments mounted on their composite backplane structure. You think of that as the telescope skeleton. And then underneath that, there's this big frame we call the BSF, or the backplane support fixture. And into that uh, fixture, we will put the um, integrated science instrument module, which is the four science instruments. And that's actually sitting at the back right now, waiting to be inserted into the backplane support fixture and bolted into place. And at that point, we will have the complete um, telescope and instrument structure ready to be shipped down to Texas for its end-to-end -end testing. The deployment sequence takes roughly um, a month from launch. And then once we've deployed the whole of the telescope, we still have to wait for things to cool down. So probably you know, we're into a six to eight week time period before everything is cool enough that we can actually start taking images. And of course, the first images from this telescope will not be nice, um, well-focused images because it's a segmented uh, mirror telescope. So the first step when we start doing what's called first light imaging is to find the 18 images, one for each of those mirror segments, get them aligned. And then we go through a process called course phasing, where we get all of those images aligned and then stacked on top of each other. And then we do fine phasing, where we actually align each of the mirrors so that we have the exact prescription of the primary mirror. And at that point, which is probably about um, four, four and a half months into the commissioning period, we will start to be able to get you know, the final image quality that this telescope's designed to deliver. So it's not um, a case of instant gratification that when you take the first image, everything looks great. It, this telescope needs a lot of um, adjustments and alignment on orbit as we um, start to do the deployments and put everything together. The excitement about um, working on a project like this is you get to see something from the very early design phases where people are talking about the science and how great it would be if we could do this to actually thinking about what you need to do to make the next big groundbreaking scientific observation. And for us working on James Webb, it's, you know, Hubble's been able to get to this point but if we want to go further, for instance, to be able to see the very first galaxies, we need to take that next step. So it, it was very uh, exciting in the early phases to think about how we would do that. And then having come up with a concept for this very large space infrared telescope, actually thinking and figuring out how you would actually build something that big and be able to fly it in an existing fairing. And then as you get into the actual uh, phase where you're building the telescope, there are continual uh, technical challenges that have to be overcome, and every one of those is kind of a big team effort. So we have, you know, absolutely fantastic engineering and uh, management team on this uh, program, and it's just a privilege to work with these guys every day to solve problems and move on to the next one. And people always ask me, you know, what's, what's, what worries you most about this telescope? And my answer is always the problem we're going to be thinking about solving tomorrow. So that. It's, it's a real privilege to work with these guys. And I think, as you can see here, they've done an absolutely amazing job putting this telescope together so far.